mindset that a lot of people don't have, but it's so important, is the fact that there was time past, but now, ages to come. And those are the dispensations that God wants us to get straight. Because if we go back and try to make time past our doctrine, there's all kinds of confusion going on. And that's titled my message this morning. The title of my message is, if I can get this silly thing right here, I think I'm having trouble with it. The confusion about salvation and the believer's walk. And I want to talk about that this morning because there's a lot of confusion. And the reason is, is that uh, they don't dispensationally interpret the Bible. For instance, about salvation and good works in a person's life. Under the law, it was said this, James chapter 2, verse 14 following, What doth it profit, my brethren, though a man say he hath faith and hath not works? Can faith save him? Now, that's an important question. Now, we would say yes, but not under law. James speaking to the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Then he says in verse 17, Even so, faith... If it hath not works, is dead, being alone. Verse 24. You see then how that by works a man is justified, and not by faith only. So that's under law. Then you see under grace, in Romans chapter 4, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed, place to our account, if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. And then chapter 5, verse 1, Therefore being justified by faith, not faith plus works, faith alone. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So there's a difference of being under law, faith that has to have works to prove its true faith, or just faith alone, because it's grace alone. And there's a big difference there, isn't there? Now, I'm going to answer some simple questions. What must I do to be saved? That's the most important question that a person needs to answer correctly, doesn't he? Because that determines one's heaven and one's hell. We're sinners, and we need a Savior. As sinners, we deserve to die. We deserve to ultimately one day go to hell. But Christ died for our sins and wants to be our Savior. Why does he want that? Because he loves us. I don't know why he loves us. I've met some of you. It'd be a hard time. <laughs> I'm kidding. Romans 5, 8. Boy, that was true. But God commendeth his Lord love toward us. And that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us, didn't he? Even while we were sinners, he wants to be our Savior. When one person is drowning, a lifeguard can't save them until that person stops kicking their legs and waving their arms. They can't be saved until they stop trying to save themselves. Now notice this. All that Christ asks of us today to save us is for us to stop trying to save ourselves by our own good works. Amen? And to trust and to believe that he alone, he died for our sins. He paid the debt of our sins on the cross. On the cross, he died, he shed his blood. Then he rose from the grave to make us right with God. Then we just rest in that truth in faith. That alone. That's it. You have God's word on that. Now, if you don't believe that, you remain lost. And you're going to be troubled your entire life by trying to do things to help pay for your own sins. And you always will be wondering, I wonder if I did enough. And by the way, you can never do enough. You can take the works of all of mankind and still go to hell. Because it's not what man does, it's what Christ has accomplished. Amen? 
Now, notice these verses here, Titus 3, 5. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he has saved us. Not by our works, okay? That has nothing to do with it. Romans 4, 5 says this, But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Christ gives you his righteousness just because of your faith in him. 1 Corinthians 15, 1, Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also you have received, and wherein you stand. Verse 3 and 4 is the gospel. For I delivered unto you, first of all, uh, which I also, that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins, according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. That's the gospel in a nutshell. The Philippian jailer said to Paul in Acts 16, 30, and brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thy house, if they believe also. So the Bible makes it very, very clear. The only thing we need to do is to believe in Christ and his finished work. He died for us, was buried, and rose again. Now, do we have to repeat the sinner's prayer to be saved? We discussed that before. Now, let me just say something about that. It doesn't hurt, but understand something. God doesn't ask us to pray the gospel. He only asks us to believe the gospel. Hello? He only asks us to believe the gospel. And the moment in the heart we believe that Christ is the Son of God, he died for my sins, was buried, rose again for us, we come to the conclusion he did that for me. The moment we do that, we were saved, we were sealed, and we were made alive in Christ. God didn't wait until we repeated a prayer. He saved us when we believed it in our heart. Amen? Ephesians 1, 13. In whom you also trusted after that you heard... Faith comes by hearing the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also after that you believed, you were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. Chapter 2, verse 1 says this here, And you hath he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. He's made us alive. And that happens the moment you believe. Likewise, we don't have to. We can if you want to. We don't have to ask Jesus into our heart for the same reason. When we believe the gospel in our heart, immediately at that moment, Christ through the Holy Spirit, he takes up residence in our heart. 2 Corinthians 1.22, who hath also sealed us and given the earnest of the Spirit in our hearts. Ephesians 3.15, that Christ may dwell where? In your hearts by faith. So he comes and takes up residence in our hearts, in our body. And notice this, Christ enters our heart whether we ask him to or not. Just so we believe. And it's when we believe, that's when he enters. It happens in your heart. Several things automatically happens the moment we believe. He comes into, golly, I thought I was under investigation or something. He, <laughs> several things automatically happens the moment we believe. He comes into our heart, our body. All our sins are forgiven. Huh? All. What does all mean? Boy, that's hard, isn't it? All my past sin, all my present sin, all my future sin. It's all under the blood of Christ. Not only that, he redeems us. That means he purchases us out of the slave of sin that we were in and places us in Christ to set us free. He justifies us. He declares in heaven, on our account in heaven, our position, he declares us, you're righteous now. That's pretty good. And the reason we're righteous in our position is because it's Christ's righteousness of us being in him. Then he sanctifies us and spiritually baptizes us by the Holy Spirit into the body of Christ. 
Now, those things I just said, we don't have to ask for any of these things. These things happen the moment we believe the gospel. Automatically, bam, you're seated there. You hear the truth. God works in your heart and you sense his presence there and in your heart you said, I believe this. And bam, before you say anything, before you pray, before anything, he comes and he lives in you. And he does all these wonderful things for you. And it's all yours because of faith. Do we have to promise to make Jesus Lord in order to be saved? Let me just say that's a work. Some people say, well, that's part of the sinner's prayer. For instance, I now make you Lord of my life to be saved. My question would be, where's the gospel? Huh? You need the gospel. And the problem is, is when you're telling Christ you'll make him Lord of your life in a prayer that you're praying to save you, you're promising to obey him. And that is works. What happens later then when you're not obeying the Lord, when he's not the Lord of your life? You're going to have all kinds of doubt. You see, it's not about making him Lord in order to be saved. It's about making him our Savior by faith in the gospel. That's how it works. Amen? I got one amen. Making him Lord is about what you're doing instead of what he's done to save you from your sins. So, we just believe that the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is enough to save us. I don't need anything else to save me. That alone saves me. Amen? Now, salvation, it's all by grace. We don't follow the law, we follow grace. Then, there's the truth about the believer's walk, and that's what I want to focus on. When we do believe the gospel, we're saved. And then after salvation happens, God wants us to walk in his ways. He wants us to walk in good works. Say, in good works, baby. In good works. Say it with me, okay? In good works. Thank you. <laughs> Whoa. Uh, you're all going to need to stand up again and shake hands here before this is over with. You need to wake up. Stop thinking about Christmas. It'll be okay. Just file bankruptcy afterward. Don't worry about it. Now, years ago, somebody said this. I looked for the church and found it in the world. I looked for the world and found it in the church. Now, if that were true back then... That's more true today, is it not? And we see it. Some say this. We're not saved by good works. But if saved, you'll have good works. And if not, you're not saved. I used to say that as a Baptist for nearly 40 years. Okay? I'd always, always say that. If a person says they're a believer, yet doesn't walk in the things of God or have good works, does that prove they're not saved? And the answer is no. First of all, only God knows a person's heart. And we have to be careful about judging people. Well, they're not saved. Uh, you have to watch that. Now, here's some verses I want you to think through. Ephesians 2, 8 and following, you know, it's the, it used to be the Baptist National Anthem, okay? For by grace are you saved through faith, that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we all say, amen. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, that's our salvation, unto good works, which God before ordained that we should walk in them. Now notice, leave that up there just for a second. The last part of that there. 
Notice Paul says believers must walk in good works there. Oh, doesn't say that, does it? Huh? What does it say? Should walk in good works. So that tell, does that not imply that maybe we won't? Huh? Doesn't that imply maybe we won't? Huh? Under the law, Moses always told the people what to do. Thou shalt do this, thou, and then all the shall nots. And it was commanded. It was demanded. It was under the law. It was demand, demanding of obedience and producing good works or fruit automatically. But under today's grace, Paul is always telling believers what we should do in response to grace. Just like they sang that last song. Didn't that move you? Huh? You're ready to say, God, here's my heart. I believe that. I'm the one. You say, huh? See, that's responding to grace. And that's what God wants us to do. When saved, we get a new life. And we should live in that new life. But it's not by force. It's a choice. Whereas under law demanded, under grace, it's up to us if we want to or not. Amen? That's why some live for Christ and some don't live for Christ. Romans 6, 4 says this here. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism, that's spirit baptism, into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also, what? Should walk in newness of life. Because of what's happened to us, because of God's grace working in us, we should. Why does God have to beg us? I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies alive. He's begging them to. Why? We should. But many times we don't. Amen? Romans 6, 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Chapter 7, verse 4. Wherefore, my brethren, ye also are become dead to the law by the body of Christ, that you should be married to another, even to him who is raised from the dead, that we should bring forth fruit unto God. We should bring forth fruit unto God. And then it states this in 1 Corinthians. But now, oh, I'm sorry. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. States in 2 Corinthians 5.15, and that he died for all that they which should, hence, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again, that they which lived should not henceforth live unto themselves, but they ought to be living for Christ. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3. For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. Under law, demanded. Under grace, it's a choice. This is what we should do because of God's grace. But we know that believers struggle with sinful things. I do. I don't know about you. That's not excusing. That's just a fact. Some believers don't live a lifestyle, a behavior of good works. They're saved. They're on their way to heaven, but it's interesting. You watch them. They're on their way to heaven, but you could not ever tell it by looking at their lifestyle. Hello? I've learned 
it's much, much, much easier to walk in our flesh, to sin, to walk in the nature that we've inherited from Adam, than to walk in the Spirit. Because to walk in the Spirit, it takes effort in Bible study, especially dispensationally, so we don't try to live under the law's demands and commandments, but that we live under grace to freely choose to love and serve Jesus Christ. Amen? And we study the Word, yielding to its truths. And it's when we make a commitment to the truth of God and we create a routine in our life, it's then that in our life it explodes, it produces good works. Galatians 6, 9, Paul says, And let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. But the sad thing about it is today, there are a lot of believers. They just won't jeopardize their social lives for Jesus Christ. They've compromised. They want to please other people rather than God. Jesus said this in John 12, 42. Nevertheless, among the chief rulers also many believed on him, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God, even though they believed. Huh? At times, these believers, they know certain things are wrong, but they willfully, they disobey the truth. Even us, we quench the spirit in our life as we lie, cheat, use foul language, feel pride, envy, lust. You see, a gutter lifestyle is not what a Christian should be doing. And if they do, they'll have no power, no peace, no stability, no answered prayer, and no victory in their life. 2 Timothy 2, 26, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. They're at the mercy because they're not using the armor of God, the word of God, the spirit of God, the things of God, the ways of God. They're not using that that protects them. They can't resist the devil. They can't help but be hit by the darts of the devil. And they wonder why they're always defeated. They're allowing sin to be a part of their life. Amen? After thinking about this, especially a Scripturally, I'm thankful to God that our salvation does not rest upon what we do. Amen. It rests upon what Christ did for us on Calvary's cross. But the question is, did we do that? Did we say, I believe that, that's for me? Probably, I'm about done here. Probably the most carnal believers that Paul ever wrote to were the Corinthians, the Corinthians. They walked like unsaved men and not as saved people. They didn't walk like they should. What Christ wanted them, the way Christ wanted them to. It says this in 1 Corinthians 3. I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, mature, but as unto carnal, fleshly, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able, for ye are yet carnal. Now, isn't that, that's an interesting word. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? There's nothing going on in your life for the things of God. 
You don't look like you're saved. You don't live like you're saved. You're just walking like lost people. That's what he's saying to them. But in spite of their ungodly living, Paul calls them in 1 Corinthians 1, 2, unto the church of God, which is at where? Corinth. To them that are sanctified, set apart for God, in Christ Jesus, been saved, called to be saints with all and every place and so on. Paul says these Corinthian carnal believers, he said, now this is what God says you're to be and you are. You're saints. Huh? So you can't always tell when you see somebody if they're sinning, if they're saved or not. It might be part of that time in their life that they've turned their back on God, but they're still saved. They're just not doing what they should be doing for Jesus Christ. Amen? And I'm not making excuses for sin. Should we sin more that grace might more abound? God forbid. Amen? Amen. Remember, living for Christ is a free choice under grace. Grace is not obligatory or mandatory. It's a free gift with no strings attached. The choice is ours. As God did with Adam and Eve, he didn't make them robots. He wants a people who will choose him to love him and do what they should. That's what he wants. But remember, a disobedient, Loose living Christian makes their testimony a reflection upon our, our testimony ineffective in our society. And Christians today too often are seen as hypocrites and they are a reproach to Christ's name. What do you think about when you hear the name Jim Baker? Jimmy Swigert, Benny Hinn, Frank Houston, or somebody you know that's been in the church with you and their name's coming to your mind. Why didn't they do as they should? Well, one, they might not be saved. That's between them and God, right? We understand that. But secondly, they may not be hearing true doctrine where they go to church. Out of mind, out of life. If it's not in here, the truth, it's not going to be out here. That's automatic. Amen? And then thirdly, they may be hearing the truth, but their continuing sinfulness, their hearts and their consciences have become hardened, calloused, even seared. And that prevents the Holy Spirit from working in them. And as a result of not living as they should, huh, God lets them remain in their rebelliousness in that state and suffer the consequences of their life-killing actions of their loss of rewards, behavior, and shame. There's a consequence to it. That's not our deal, that's God's deal. Remember the guy in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Paul said, it is reported commonly that there is fornication, immorality, among you as such immorality as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. So it could be his father's second marriage or something like that. I don't know. But he's having a sexual affair with his father's bride. Notice, if you would, then, verse 5. To deliver such a one. Paul says, I've already judged this, to deliver such a one and the Satan. For the destruction of the flesh 
that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Paul didn't play around with it. He says then in verse 9, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. Don't allow it to go on in your church. Do something about it. Say something. You ostracize yourself sometimes. And then he says in verse 13, But them that are without God judgeth, therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person who's committing immorality. So Paul's not easy on sin. Put them out. Let Satan have his day with him and see what happens. They're saved. Their spirit's going to be saved. We know that. But what happens if they repent? In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, about this guy, sufficient to such a man, the one who committed this sin, is the punishment which was inflicted of many. So that contrary wise... Ye ought to rather forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such a one should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. Evidently, he came to his senses and he broke his heart and he repented. And Paul said, listen, you've ostracized him. We've turned him over to Satan. If we don't hurry up and get him back in relationship with God, it's going to be too overwhelming to him to make it back. Then he says, wherefore I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. So a person doesn't have to stay that way, amen? He can begin to live as he should. I haven't been living as I should, but thank God I can live as I should. Now, I've said enough about that, about should, should, and all that. But thank God for those who do love Christ, who are so thankful for what he's done for them, that they freely choose to say to God, God, I love you. Here's my life, my all. It's for your glory. Amen? That's a free choice under grace. And because of grace, that's where we should be with, in our relationship with God, is it not? Close with these verses. 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless, the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal, the Lord knoweth them that are his, and let every one that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity or sin. Get away from it. But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and of silver, but also of wood and of earth, and some to honor and some to to dishonor. If a man therefore purge himself from these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified, and meet for the master's use, and prepared, what? Unto every good work. We begin to do as we should. And good works comes out of result of that. Amen? Second Corinthians 5 again. For the love of Christ constraineth us. That's what it ought to cause you to live like you should. It's the fact that Christ loved you. Look what he's accomplished for you. Why do we have to argue and fight with God? Why don't we just say, God, here I am, it's all yours. Amen? And then he goes on to say, and that he died for all, that they which live unto themselves uh, uh, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them, and rose again. Colossians 2, 6 and 7. As ye have therefore received Jesus Christ, or Christ Jesus, the Lord, so walk ye in him. How did you receive him? By faith. How do you live? By faith. What God's word says. Rooted and built up in him. And established in the faith as you have been taught. And what did Paul teach him? He taught him dispensational truth. That's what he taught him. But now, that dispensation. So that when Christ does come back, this is speaking about when Christ comes back for Israel, but it's the same principle for us. 1 John 2, 28 says this, 
And now, little children, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. Now, I don't know about you. A lot of people say, boy, I hope Jesus comes back today. Yeah, I do. I have mixed emotions about it, though. Because I look at my life sometimes, and I haven't lived as I should. And I wish I had lived better. Amen? And I'm afraid I'm going to be ashamed about some things one day when I stand before him. But you do with what you have left. And you live it to the fullest for Christ, for his honor and his glory. I don't know about you. I want to be a vessel of honor. Uh, and the only way I can do that is to purge myself or stay away from the sinful things, get into the word, find out what the truths are, the way I'm supposed to live right now, and get in that, anchor in that, and allow then to become a part of my everyday life. And when I do that, I'm living as I should. Nobody will ever be perfect, but thank God we can live as we should. And that's what God wants you to do, to be saved and then live as you should. Father, we love you. We thank you for your love for us. Thank you for Jesus Christ, for what he's done for us. And because of that and the grace we've received, we've not have to been under the law. We're under grace. And because of that, God help us to freely choose you because of what you've done for us, because we love you. On and on it goes. And I just pray that if there's some believers here this morning that they haven't been doing as they should, but that this morning the decision would be in their heart that they would say, it's your way, God, from now on. I believe that's what you want from all of us, just like the prodigal son did. He came to his senses. God, help us to come to our senses that the best way to go is to live for you. And may we never, ever be ashamed of that, embarrassed about that. You weren't ashamed of us when you went all the way to the cross. May we not be ashamed of you by the way we live. In Jesus' name. Everybody said? We hope that you received a blessing.